Definitely plenty uh, food for thought there now. Uh, we're going to begin now our first panel, um, looking at the future staffing needs in Irish healthcare. And we're really delighted that uh, Dr. Breda Crehan Roach, Dr. Tony Canavan, and Dr. Maureen Kelly uh, are with us here today. So they're going to come up here on the podium with us. Thank you, Dr. Maureen Kelly. And um, oh, uh, oh, I see Tony coming as well. Brilliant. Now I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, about the three, and uh, then we're, we'll open the floor, and you can ask any questions that you'd like. Um, thank you. In January 2020, Dr. Breda Crehan Roach commenced as Chief Officer for Community Healthcare West, which includes primary care, mental health, older persons, disability, and health and wellbeing services for counties Galway, Mayo, and Roscommon. Breda is formerly CEO of Ability West, providing services to children and adults with intellectual disabilities. Breda is a registered nurse, Montessori teacher, has a Master of Science in Economics and Healthcare Management. And thank you very much, Dr. Breda uh, Crown Roach, for being here. Uh, Dr. Tony Canavan, we know well from the news, <laughs> he's the CEO of CLT University Healthcare Group. He has worked in uh, health services here in the West for over 30 years. Over that time, he's held a number of appointments with the Western Health Board in the Mental Health Services, the Department of Public Health, Primary Care Services, and Acute Hospital Services. In 2015, he became Chief Officer of Community Healthcare West before returning to the CELFA Group four years later as CEO. And since April 2021, Tony has held the position of President of the Health Management Institute of Ireland. Dr. Maureen Kelly here closest to me is an um, Associate Professor and Lead of Undergraduate General Practice Teaching in the School of Medicine, University of Galway. She served as Assistant Programme Director of the Western GP Training Scheme for 20 years, where she had a special interest in the professional development of GPs and building research capacity. Her other areas of expertise include selection and recruitment of medical students, widening participation in health professions, education and civic engagement. We're delighted that you're all here. Um, I think uh, all three of you have play such, I'm going to join you over here now at the moment, y you all play such a pivotal role here in, in the West. Uh, we're open for questions from the floor, and we're also open to questions on the iPad. So if anybody wants to hit us with a few questions, I'll go into the relevant section on the iPad now in the moment, <laughs> all this technology. Well, first of all, maybe to just get the ball rolling a little bit. You know, we heard Michael Dowling talking there about how he's, how he's uh, keeping the staff, retaining the staff and everything. But maybe you could, the three of you, uh, one by one, tell us about the major staffing issues that you each are facing. Tony, maybe yourself first of all. Um, or oh, you can take the microphone there, Tony, if you want, and, uh, and, and hold it in your hand. Perfect. Okay, that's all right. Perfect. So thanks very much. I'm, I'm really conscious that in my bio I've more or less written myself out of a job over with, uh, with Mike Dowling, um, <laughs> given that I'm 30 years working in the health service. So I need to have another look at that. Um, yeah, we have very significant um, staffing challenges, and I think we've had them uh, for the longest time within the health services. What we see, though, is that it changes over time. And now we're part of a, a, a kind of a global challenge in terms of healthcare workers. Um, I think if we look specifically at our patch, our region, um, what we see is that um, there are specific grades that we have difficulties in recruiting to currently, and then we have specific locations within our region that we have difficulty recruiting mm -hmm. and retaining staff. So, for example, um, we fill posts in Galway much more quickly than we would fill them in Letterkenny, just by, right. you know, broadly speaking. Um, and that becomes a problem then for service delivery because um, uh, the sales to group works well um, when we are part of the community that we're serving. Um, when people have long-standing uh, and established relationships within that community. So what that means is that if we have staff working within their ho our hospitals, we want them to feel that they're part of a community, so we want them to be with us for a long time mm -hmm. and to be working on that. And that creates a difficulty. Um, when, we, when we have gaps and we have, um, when we have posts, we f find it difficult to fill on a permanent basis and we have locums in place. Typically, we have um, uh, difficulties in filling uh, consultant posts currently, and there's lots of controversy around that. But we also have um, a difficulty in filling other grades. So right now we have difficulty in filling healthcare assistants um, across the board, um, radiographers and other allied health professionals as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there are uh, our challenges from a recruitment perspective. Thank you. 
Dr. Peter Kainroot. Thank you, uh, and thank you for the warm welcome. I suppose just before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the collaboration and the partnership from uh, uh, University of Galway uh, during COVID and the last two and a half years, because many people across medicine, nursing, and healthcare sciences did assist us and were in the trenches with us, and we very much appreciate that. So thank you. Um, we have huge challenges. Uh, we have vacancies and we have difficulty recruiting, that's for sure. Um, I'm a great believer, and I must say, Michael Dowling's um, contribution was inspirational. And certainly, I very much um, believe in growing our own and retaining staff and promoting staff within. Um, and I'm very um, delighted to be part and, and to work in collaboration with the School of Medicine, Science and Health um, and Nursing. That's really important. The, we're finding difficulty in relation to GPs, and I know you'll be talking in a moment, um, but they are the gatekeepers. Mm. And definitely there's a difficulty trying to recruit. And I suppose if you look at the pressures that people are under, um, all healthcare workers, including GPs. I have many vacancies across the three counties, and indeed we also provide services to the islands. So certainly that is a challenge. We have um, difficulty in relation to special specialities like dietetics, uh, you know, uh, allied health professionals, nursing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they they certainly are challenging, and uh, I know that very much welcome. Um, you know, meeting with Martin and others to see what we can do here mm -hmm. and how we can uh, achieve that. And I suppose I'm really interested, you know, in relation to students because the workforce of today is very different to the workforce of yesterday. And we do know that we have to be agile and flexible. And certainly the job for life, that day is gone. Mm -hmm. And that's no harm either. But we have to look at it. And if you look at what has happened after COVID, people, quite rightly, after they graduate, are beginning to travel. And that's good because they learn and they bring back. And hopefully they come back. And, and uh, also, uh, we are doing a lot of international uh, recruitment, and that's really important. So it's really around, um, if you look at also, we have a growing population, an aging population. So that brings its own challenges. We know right now there's about 64,000 people in Ireland with dementia. This will double in 25 years' time. So certainly there is a need there. Um, and, you know, we are working very closely within the community. We're doing really exciting things with Slaunch Care, with the Enhanced Community Care Programs, with Integrated Care Programs for older people. Work closely with Tony and his colleagues in the sales group. And it has to be a seamless um, delivery of health. So I think there's lots of opportunities. I think it's a really exciting time. And I do think that collaboration with the University of Galway uh, will be a good start. And very much looking forward to doing that, but also learning from the students as to what they need also. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. What would be your top three staffing challenges, uh, Maureen? So I suppose from the GP perspective, um, the, one of the first things that we think about is how do we excite enough of our medical graduates to a career in general practice? I mean, I think if you're hearing so much about, you know, it's difficult in general practice, we lose the fact that it's actually a really exciting, challenging, rewarding place to work. And how do we ensure that enough of our medical school graduates, you know, we're talking about homegrown and, and, and have enough talent and within that population and for them to think about GP as a really exciting career for them. If you look elsewhere in the UK, they've set a target for 50% of medical school graduates to go into general practice. Canada, I think about 40% of their graduates should be looking at a career in general practice. So that's a challenge for us. How do we do that? Um, in terms of, of my GP colleagues and that, especially in rural, and we've talked a lot about, you know, our rural hinterland here in this college, uh, but certainly rural general practice, it's really, really finding it hard to recruit staff. It's very hard for staff to go, to go on holidays, for example. Mm -hmm. Rural GPs are struggling to find locums to take their well-deserved, well-earned break, but also to replace, uh, you know, GPs that are retiring from rural practices. Um, I, there, there at the beginning of the summer, there was 26 lists that had been unfilled, 13 of those for over a year. We're talking about in, in Ackle and in Charlestown, oh, more than a year mm -hmm. trying to fill a GP practice. So that, that's a challenge. And I suppose thirdly, if I was to think of the other challenges, it's not just the GP. 
the primary care team, the GP practice team, very much, and we heard our last speaker talking about how important that was, but GP practices operate as a team. Our administrative staff, our practice managers, our practice nurses, mm. so valuable. Almost 8 million consultations in general practice a year are conducted by our GP practice nurses. They are really valued colleagues, but GPs are struggling to fill GP practice nurses' places. And then you have to think more about, you know, who else do we need, like the phlebotomist, you know, advanced nurse practitioners, you know, what about pharmacists embedded in general practice? You see that elsewhere. So that GP team working together in, through the general practice setting, it, it's a real challenge at, at the moment. Sorry, Mary, I'm, I'm looking around just in case there's anyone, you know, wanting to ask a question, so just, just holler in case, I'm, in case I miss you. But you know the thing you were saying there about, um, do we need then, Maureen, maybe to be looking at, you know, you know, training, educating more people to become GPs? And I mean, I was listening to Radio on the Grand the other day, and there was this woman, she did an interview about the fact that it took, she's in Nakhnikara, and it took her a whole month to get a doctor's appointment. Yeah. A month. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of thinking to yourself, I mean, in this day and age, it shouldn't take that long. Yeah, so there's definitely a huge shortage. I mean, I don't like the word crisis. I think it's an overused word, mm. but there's definitely a real challenge facing us in general practice. And it's not only in Ireland, it's a global phenomenon. Mm. So GPs are dealing with a lot more complex, we've heard about complex multimorbidity, you know, polypharmacy. Our GPs are dealing with a lot of complex issues in the community. Um, and we definitely need more GPs. Yeah, you were talking about, are we talking about getting 1,600 more GPs 1,600 more by 2028, is that realistic? I think, you know, being honest with you, if you look at the projections, that might not even be enough. You know, uh, is it realistic looking at the workload of what GPs are doing now, the complexity that they're dealing with, the numbers of patients, the increase in population, the increase in elderly population? You know, our GPs are facing a huge challenge to deliver the care that patients deserve. Patients and their families and their carers deserve this mm -hmm. care. So, yes, it's realistic that that's the number we need. How do we get there? Yeah. That's the question. How do we, um, and, and we have to look at that being evidence based, mm -hmm. you know? What what do we know from the research evidence to show us how can you influence? It's very complex. Doctors' choices, medical students' choices as to what career to go into is complex. But there is evidence out there. We know that if we expose them to general practice early in the curriculum, if we give them really high quality, long placements, you've heard earlier our earlier speakers talking about learning by doing. We heard our, our nursing student this morning talking about it. Placing medical students out in general practice during their medical training is really influential. It makes a huge difference. In Scotland, they're looking at having 25% of medical training occurring out in general practice. I mean, it has to be meaningful. It has to be resourced and, and of high quality, but that definitely can influence career decisions. Yeah. There's a lot of things we can work on, though. That's not the only one, but it's certainly one that we can do from an educator point of view. Thank you, Doc, uh, Dr. Maureen. Uh, we have a question here now from the floor as well. I'm just trying to get the microphone to come up here to you. <laughs> Thank you very much. What's your own name and who do you have your question? Who is it directed to? Or to all of them, maybe. <laughs> yeah, my name is Caroline McIntosh. I'm head of the School of Health Sciences here in the University of Galway. Um, it's, it's open to the, or any of the, the uh, speakers. Um, we're hearing a lot about the role of, you know, the important role of nurses and doctors. I suppose as, as head of the health sciences, um, you know, there's a whole workforce of health and social care professionals um, who are highly skilled graduates who have huge potential to take on more advanced practitioner roles within the health services. Um, I suppose my, my maybe more of a point than, than maybe a question. Um, I think we underutilize our allied health professions. I think there's a lot of barriers to stop them really from working at the top of their license. Um, things like access to prescription only medicines, uh, etc. Um, I think there's a lot that we could do to enable our very capable workforce, and it's a big workforce when you combine all of our allied mm -hmm. health professions together, um, to really play a much more of an important role in leadership within the health service within Ireland. Mm. So, are we underutilizing people, I wonder? Oh, actually, we have a few more microphones here. So, that's an easy one for me to agree with. I think that's absolutely true. And, um, 
uh, I think there's huge potential within um, existing grades, within the health services, within the hospital system um, uh, that we aren't tapping into currently, so we need to do that. I do think um, uh, that there are opportunities that are arising currently with the rollout of Sloan Care, with the formation of the regional health areas. It causes us to maybe look more broadly. What is, uh, a bit like Mike was saying earlier on, you know, wh where in the continuum or how are we managing that continuum of care for the patient right through from start to finish? And then where can, in, uh, can uh, professionals add value to that process? Um, I think we need, certainly need as part of that to look at, um, you know, if we're recruiting um, adult health professionals, for example, into the hospital system, are we also recruiting the same people or even training them through the community system so that they have a flavor uh, uh, of both, so they understand that full continu continuum of care and they appreciate it and they can see more clearly where they fit in. So I absolutely think that there's, over the coming five years there's great potential for us to develop that further. We need to be open to, to grabbing it though, yeah, for sure. I might just come in here, I agree with all of that and just to say that uh, we certainly need more people trained for sure. Um, and we're doing quite innovative things like social prescribing, you know, health promotion, health and well-being. And it's not just for the consumer or the patient or the service user, it's about the staff as well. So we have to look after our staff and the whole um, area of compassionate leadership and working across boundaries and certainly um, that multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary teams have a lot to offer. So certainly um, it's a very exciting time for sure and I think we also need to uh, go out there and we do see at the moment unfortunately that people are not choosing to go into health and social care profession so we need to look at that and why is that and how can we make it more attractive because that is the future they are the leaders of the future for sure. I think just to get back to your question, from a GP perspective, I think it would be really, really welcome. I mean, I think, you know, talking to GP colleagues, access to our allied health professionals, we would see them as part of our you know, really important team approach and, and, you know, delivering care in the community where the patients are. Um, but I think access to the allied health services professionals is really an issue for GPs. You know, uh, apart from private access, which is obviously not the kind of care that we want to be providing to everybody, we want it to be, you know, that finance or your ability to pay is not something that would hinder you from getting the care that you deserve. So I would think that it would be really, really welcome in general practice if we've ha had much more allied health professionals. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Tony, I, uh, this might be a little bit of an unfair question, but you know the plan by the government to uh, you know, establish these regional health areas. Um, do you believe that a Western health board would be a good idea? I think that's the back to the future question, isn't it? Our yeah, future, more whatever or less. it is. Anyway. <laughs> so, a um, short answer is actually uh, no, but I do think no. that um, uh, no, because I think that there, there were issues um, associated with the health board structure. We did operate then in different silos, you know, so we had geographical silos, and the Western Health Board, um, you know, was entirely separate from the Midwestern Health Board or the Northwestern mm. Health Board. But patients don't observe those kind of boundaries. So. Today, for example, there are patients on the road from, on the N17 heading from Letterkenny down to Galway Hospital to receive care because they need care that's available in Galway and that's where they should get it. So they're just driving across all the county boundaries and all the regional boundaries. And that's what we should be more focused on. What, what makes sense to patients? Now, within that, there has to be some organisation. And I think the sensible organisation is the one that's proposed currently for the West, which is very much around Donegal, Sligo, Leitrim, Galway, May and Roscommon. Uh, the hospitals that are part of the group, which as it happens conveniently are all sales to group hospitals within that CHO West, which is Galway Mayo and Roscommon, and part of CHO 1. That coming together makes sense because it's a reasonable organisation of a population of about 800,000 and it, the boundaries that we're kind of containing within that generally makes sense for patients. Not perfectly, but generally makes sense for patients. So, so my honest opinion is, you know, let's go forward with that six county model and, um, and progress that. I think that's... But is that the model that was there already, Tony? Like with the Western Health Board? Was it kind of the same thing? Well, I've said that there were things wrong with the Western Health Board. There were lots of things that were right with the yeah. Western Health Board and the Health Board structure. So, for example, the, some of the things that were right with them were around autonomy. Autonomy to be able to recruit, even though we have that not yeah. cracked now. So we have autonomy to be able to procure we haven't that not cracked. Mm -hmm. Autonomy over our own estate, over our own buildings, we haven't that not cracked. So Mike talked earlier on about a, a bureaucracy within the HSE. That's one of the frustrations of being part of a large national organization mm -hmm. that we're tied into that. So if you're, again, my honest answer is some of the 
the good things about the health board structure, like that type of autonomy, we do need to get back to that for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael also spoke about, you know, the, the cancer care services, you know, in the way that 95% of them in Northwell are outpatient, aren't they? Yeah. And still we have, as you say, people travelling from Donegal, coming down to Galway, five hours if not longer, to attend cancer services. So, you know, do we need to kind of think outside the box as well now? We do, and, um, and from a cancer perspective, um, unfortunately, you know, within the hospital, we do tend to think within the hospital, so we need to think more broadly than mm -hmm. that and think about um, how, um, uh, how patients are accessing services at different stages of, the, of that continuum. So, for example, um, we have really good um, uh, outpatient um, services in terms of chemotherapy um, in pretty much all of our hospitals okay. at this stage, Letter Kenny, Sligo, Port Yonkla, Mayo, and in Galway as well. So that's good. That means mm -hmm. that people can avail those services um, locally. Uh, we, we are just developing a new radiotherapy unit. That will be centralised, but it needs to be because it needs that mass of about a million population in order to make it viable. But that's only a small part of that cancer journey for most patients. Mm -hmm. And there's the, you know, everything else that takes place outside of it, things that take place in general practice and things that take place in community and so on. And we need to be, I suppose, um, more open to the importance of those. Okay, thanks, Bill and Tony. Uh, any, oh yeah, another question here from the floor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Georgina Gatman, School of Nursing in Midwifery. There's been a lot of focus on recruitment, which is uh, valuable and worthy, but I wonder to what extent we have focused on retention. And I say that, you know, I suppose maybe there is a lot of work done on it. I'm not, I don't know, and I'm perhaps asking the question. And I wonder to what extent we have looked at exit interviews with people, whether it's from the university, from the health system, because we see huge amounts that are taking perhaps early retirement or who are leaving, who are um, moving. Are we offering people another option to stay within the health system, different to the role that they have? And I think when COVID hit, we saw, I mean, every vaccination centre, the amount of retired staff that were, it was like walking back into the wards, you know, <laughs> gosh, you're still here or whatever. So people were still interested in working but they may not have been interested in continuing to work in the role that they were in. And I just think that we're constantly seeing this exit of highly skilled people, but also what we're losing is a huge level of mentorship for new staff coming in, you know, particularly from a nursing point of view. That is, it's, we're oozing that out from the system. So I just wonder in terms of retention or understanding people's reasons for exiting, uh, to what extent are we looking at that? Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. And how could people, you know, like Michael Dowling was saying, you know, change from, from surgery to HR? You know, is, there, is that kind of flexibility in, in the service? And that's something certainly we need to embrace. Uh, we do do uh, exit inter interviews. Right now, and it's not unique to Ireland, an awful lot of people are leaving health, that's for sure. And burnout is significant. Um, certainly COVID and also the cyber attack because we've had a tough, tough uh, three years really. If you look at what happened then, boundaries dropped. People worked across boundaries. People came back that had left and we were very, very fortunate that they did. Students came out and worked with us. So there's huge learning in that. And I think we need to be flexible. We need to be more um, friendly, worker friendly, family friendly. Um, and we have hybrid now. We've done a lot with digital health. So we can do more, that's for sure. But certainly retention is an issue and we do need to understand why and look at offering people, um, you know, work that suits their lifestyle. That's, that's going to be important, but yet have sustainable workforces because we need those too. Um, and I think nothing um, replaces people working in, in teams. And I suppose there's a danger if we do too much hybrid or too much digital, and we certainly have uh, had huge investment over the last three years in that. But people do need to meet. Um, people create and they spark off each other. So I think we do need to look at the health and well-being. And burnout is an issue for staff. And by doing that, we certainly should be able to help retention. Thank you. 
Yeah, you certainly felt that camaraderie, actually, you know, when you went into the vaccination centres, you know, there was a real, there was a real buzz around the place. Sorry, Maureen. Yeah, just to come from the GP perspective, again, I suppose we are looking at it as a kind of a multi-pronged approach about how we, we meet our workforce challenges. Training more is one, but retaining more is definitely a huge part of the, of the drive in general practice, you know, to make sure that we keep our, our GP service uh, operational. So I guess when we're thinking about retaining, you have to think about the workload being manageable for the GP. It's not just about put GPs out there, it's can they manage the workload that's expected of them. And that is why, to get back to the earlier speaker's question about the multi-professional teams like it, within general practice so building and supporting that access to allied health professions really valuable relationships but also to remove disincentives to young GPs coming out so for example a disincentive to new graduates is the idea of the bricks and mortar having to provide the premises for your for your GP practice to run out of so we should look be looking at ways of supporting that with collaboration mm -hmm. with our HSC colleagues but also supporting staff for example, our practice nurses, again, as I said earlier, are so valuable, but they don't have the same career structure or promotion or uh, support that they would expect from their, that their hospital colleagues can, can have, because it's a different system. It's a, it's a, you know, the GP is their contractor and employer. But elsewhere, if you look at other countries, what they have done around the HSC partner or the, the, the equivalent partner, supporting the staff within the GP practices, you know, even thinking of holidays for them or supporting towards training, staff development, that sort of partnership I think is really important to maintain the workforce, retain our workforce in general practice. Yeah, brilliant. And Tony, did you want to make a point? Uh, just a very quick point yeah. to, to link Georgina's yeah. question with something that Michael was saying earlier on, and it's to do with the vaccination centres. I think one of the things that we achieved in the vaccination centres when we established them was very early on there was a very clear sense of purpose, what, mm -hmm. you know, what they were trying to do. And mm -hmm. Michael was saying earlier on that uh, you know, people, uh, people work for a cause. Well, the cause in the vaccination centres was super clear, so it was, it was really clear. So um, you know, the, the, uh, the levels of motivation among staff um, to deliver on that were very high. So the question then for myself then is, uh, you know, uh, as we try to establish regional health areas, we've started to try to roll out Solange Care, are there opportunities for to create that same sense of common purpose across the whole mm -hmm. geography? It's difficult, it's more complex, but actually I think it's doable and I think it's another opportunity for us within this new structure, that it is possible for us to establish a clearer sense of purpose between general practice, community services and the hospital services and everybody working within them. And I suppose also bringing the college in, uh, Tony, as well, in, uh, the whole thing. Completely. Yeah, we're, we're it's, it's all, all, it's we're all, all part of the one mm -hmm. ecosystem. So we are, and uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a question from the floor here. Thank you. Is it? <laughs> These things must have been flung around earlier on. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one. Ah, oh, great. Thank you. Don't work with animals, kids and technology. <laughs> um, just a question for the panel, or maybe a comment, and this is not unique to SAILTA, to the community care areas that we work in, this is a national issue, but I'm increasingly frustrated by, um, so we know that one of the reasons that staff stay is increased levels of autonomy. Of course, staff have autonomy, staff that increases their job satisfaction. But one of the real frustrations, I think, in the Irish healthcare system is that, in Caroline's point, staff's potential is not used and autonomy is often suppressed. Examples are public health nurses requiring referral through GPs that are really busy to refer patients to physio, to acute hospital services, etc. Waste of time, quite frankly, I would see. Things like A&E nurses with 20 year experience because of regulations, having to have a particular course done before they can refer somebody directly in some hospitals for an x-ray, for example. Mm -hmm. So we've lots of blocks in our pathway system. And I'm wondering, is it an opportunity for us to work together to see where those, uh, that autonomy in clinical decision-making can be increased across our healthcare staff, both nurses, midwives, allied health professionals, because that has the added benefit potentially of increasing autonomy, increasing with job satisfaction, increasing retention, and maybe people just providing better care to the person at that point in time. Tony, Tony maybe direct that one to you. <laughs> I, I was actually 
I I'll read it. You just pass the mic to me. I'll come back. You know, I think I'll come back to you, Tony. I, I actually think that would be really welcome in general practice. I know my GP colleagues, like our practice nurses are so skilled and their skills are not actually being utilised efficiently. And I think we are struggling to fill practice nurse positions in general practice because they don't see a career path, a career progression there for them. So I think that uh, the idea of advanced nurse practitioners in general practice prescribing a nurse specialists is hugely welcome. And that's only one discipline. We have all, we have all our other disciplines and our allied health professions, but I do think that thinking about how to make the model different for the future. I think that these conversations and working together mm -hmm. and this type of forum is so important to have these conversations and make these changes. I think they'd be really welcome and it would lead to things like better retention, better workload management, but ultimately it's all about the patient mm -hmm. really, isn't it? At the end of the day, better care for the patient. Who wants to go and see the GP after they've just seen the nurse who told them they need an x-ray and now they have to wait for the GP to tell them that they need an x-ray? You know, that is frustrating for the patient and for both the doctor and, and the nurse. So I think it's welcome and I think that, that change needs to happen. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, and the only thing that I'd add to that, I, I'd also welcome it, and it was actually um, linking to the point that Caroline made earlier as well, Declan, but, um, uh, but the only thing I'd add to it is that we all need to be involved in that, including, you know, at, at training and education stages and so that the culture of, um, of how teams work together and how they function together for the consumers, Michael describes them, or for patients, you know, whatever words you want to use, that's, I, th I think that's important. We all have a role to play in it. I might just yeah. add, uh, thank you for that question. I think it's really important. And, you know, we have great opportunities now. And if you look at what we achieved during COVID, we were able to get people trained in vaccinations. We're now doing monkeypox as well and everything else. So we can do it. And I think the crisis created the sense of urgency. So let us now create a sense of urgency and try and deal with some of those issues. And if you look at what's happening with chronic disease and the hubs, the ambulatory, ambulatory hubs in relation to ICPOP for older people, certainly there will be more multidisciplinary people working together. We have to look at equity, we have to look at reflective practice, we have to look at autonomy also. And I think it will challenge some people that there might be a little bit of power struggles, but that has to be challenged and that has to be changed. Um, so I, I can see that this is something that will happen. I think we create our own urgency ourselves in relation to that. And the consumer, the customer, the um, service user, the patient out there, that's, that's what they want. And I suppose there's a vested interest for all of us because we are all uh, also potentially consumers of health. So it's up to us to make sure that there is a future there for everybody. And, you know, what's looking now, we, we have to start looking at, um, you know, associates and, you know, assistants and uh, in, in relation to keeping people out of hospital and especially the older population, home support workers are really important. We have difficulty recruiting them and we're trying to be flexible in relation to hours to suit people and lifestyles. We have to make that a career and progression within that and you will attract people then. That is my firm belief. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, Breda, just on that point, you know, we've all, you know, we've all had the relation, you know, who's gone into hospital with some minor thing and then they're in hospital, they fall out of the bed, they break a hip, you know, disasters happen. Um, but I'm not saying that, you know, everything's a disaster, but, it, you know, these, these things happen sometimes, especially with the older people. Let's talk about integrated care. What does it mean for the, you know, the typical patient in the West of Ireland? H how that... How would that look? Well, if you look at older people and, uh, you know, the whole uh, ICPOP, the Integrated Care for Older People, that programme, and we've worked closely with the likes of Dr. Michelle Canavan um, and people like that very closely um, across SAILTA and Community Healthcare West. And if you look at a typical, somebody comes in, the sustain a fracture, you need to get them out in, obviously, to be treated in the hospital, mm -hmm. but out quickly. And you do need transitional care beds, you need respite step down. Mm -hmm. And we have those facilities now, so we need to use them correctly and appropriately. 
um, and we also need to upskill our nursing staff, in particular in the community nursing units, um, you know, to do some subacute care and to get people out of the hospital. And we're working very closely with Tony and, and our colleagues in sales in relation to getting people out quickly, um, you know, the whole area of delayed transfers of care. And I suppose what challenges us also is the complexity of people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people are sicker um, and they are you know, uh, treated within their homes now. So we have to look at what, how can we make that possible? How can we make that better? We have to listen to the consumer. And we're doing an awful lot of work now with consumer panels, uh, with service users, engagement in relation to the chronic diseases, and learning from that as to how we can make things better. But home care and keeping people at home, if that is their choice, mm -hmm. that is what we need to do. And that's a myriad of, of, of various people, from home support workers, to um, you know, visiting clinical nurse specialists, to geriatricians, to um, you know, physios, OTs, SLTs, whatever the person requires. Uh, you also spoke, Breed, about you know. Sorry, did I see a question from the floor there? Oh, no, maybe not. Um, I was just thinking, you know, you spoke about the excitement of of to care, Breed. You know, how is that going to? Will that help? You know, uh, healthcare at home and stuff. Most certainly will, uh, and yeah. certainly I think the gatekeeper obviously is the GP, and unfortunately we are seeing difficulties in getting, um, rec you know, getting new people in, replacing people, a lot of locum, um, and, and looking to get it. So we have to look at that and. Uh, how can we help people? How can we make it easier? How can we work with people to make uh, a better work-life balance? That's, that's very important. And Slauncher Care certainly will work and we can do it for sure. And I think that if you look at what we've achieved through COVID and cyber, which was also a big, a big um, issue for us, we've achieved an awful lot and we can do an awful lot more. Well, on that positive note, I think uh, we'll end this panel. Breda Crane Roach, uh, Dr. Maureen Kelly, and Tony Canavan, thank you all very much for that and for all your patience as well. Thank you.